Welcome to a special edition of KOMU 8 News. I'm Jim Rick, and thanks for joining us this evening. It's election night across America. We're going to do something we've never done before. For the next hour and a half, we're going to bring you analysis and context about the Missouri races as well as the presidential race on our new streaming platform. We want to remind you that this show will be streaming on our website, the KOMU mobile app, also on Roku and Apple TV. We hope you'll stick with us throughout the evening. Right now, we are broadcasting live from the studios here at the Reynolds Journalism Institute, RJI, on the MU campus. In the meantime, Emily Spain is holding things down holding the fort down at the KOMU 8 studios. How are you doing this evening, Emily? Yeah, hey, Jeb, it's going to be a busy night, that's for sure. And, you know, we've got about 10 teams totaling about 30 people all across mid-Missouri and the state. And I'll be joining you every half hour or so to bring you the latest on local returns. And we'll also have some live updates from the field. And as you know, Jim, NBC News will also have that extensive coverage of the presidential race. So if you want to keep Channel 8 on your TV and our streaming show on your laptop, your cell phone. We will have you covered for the night and well into the morning if we have to. So, Jim, how many election nights have you been through in your years here at Channel 8? Well, let's take a look at the overall picture. This will be the 13th election, and, I, and I'll tell you about the first one and, and the one that I remember the most. The first one was in 1976. That was Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. and Gerald Ford. Uh, it was, I was working part-time, I, I was finishing college in Joplin, and the Jasper County Courthouse is in Carthage, about 15 miles away. And my job was to get the latest results, run to a payphone, try to beat <laughs> all of the other reporters, be the first at the payphone, and then call collect back to the TV station. Uh, those were primitive times. Uh, things have slightly changed. The, the, the election I remember the most is 2000, there's no doubt. Uh, I was working with Beth Malicki, and you know, as the night went on, we realized um, that we're not gonna know who the Missouri governor is, we're not going to know who the Missouri senator is, that was Ashcroft and Gene Carnahan, and we weren't gonna know who the president was, Bush or Gore. And about 8.30 in the morning, Stacy Wolfel, our news director, just came up to Beth and I and said, just go home, come back in <laughs> five or six hours, but just go home, so, you know, so we did. And, and Jim, you know, there is a chance that we might know some of the results from tonight, a historic election record voter turnout already being predicted. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the figure that I heard for Missouri absentee votes was astonishing. And I, I've heard stories today just here in Columbia about how long it took to stand in line to get to vote. Luckily for me, my polling place, as you well know, I live over in Callaway County, and, and my polling place is a new church there in Fulton. I literally walked in the door, they pointed to the station, and I was out of there in two or three minutes. Yeah, it only took me about 10, so I guess we're the lucky ones today. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, who yes, do you so. have coming up tonight? Yes, so. You have several guests tonight joining you. Oh, gosh. Uh, we, we've got Kathy Kiley, a journalism professor and former White House correspondent. We also have Tracy wilson Kleekamp, a lady that I got to know 20 years ago when she first got here to Columbia, Perville Squires, and then also Michael McKinney. So we've got a lot of guests and, and a lot of questions to ask. Okay, thanks, Jim. We're going to send it over to you at Reynolds Journalism Institute for the rest, and I'll see you guys in a little bit here with updates from KOMU8. Jimbo. Okay, sounds very good. Election clerks started tabulating absentee and mail-in ballots early this morning. Polls opened at 6 a.m. in Boone County. A new tabulating machine was put to work to help with the large number of mail-in votes. There were thousands of mail-in and in-person absentee ballots in Boone County. KOMU 8's Matt McCabe joins us live via Skype from the county clerk's office downtown. Jim, right now I'm at the Boone County Government Center. I'm on the first floor here, and if you just take a look behind me, they have all these carts lined up, and these are ready to receive the precinct results as they bring them in after polls close. And actually, they just close now shortly at 7 p.m., and so those will be here any minute now. We actually spoke to Boone County Clerk uh, Brianna Lennon just minutes ago before we came on the air. And she said so far they know that they've 
had about 60,000, just more than 60,000 people so far today vote in person, but she said she expects that number to get closer to about 91,000 people. And the latest numbers for mail-in and absentee ballots is 28,000 ballots. So again, we've, we've got all of this lined up just all around the first floor of the government center right now. The tabulating room itself that you talked about, Jim, it's up on the second floor up there in the corner, and they were busy in that room today. They had a second machine that was going to help them out, counting all of the, the influx of mail-in and absentee ballots. And so we'll be here all night at 9 and 10. We're going to talk about the latest updates with numbers that we know, and of course, watch the results as those start to come in. Live in Columbia, Matt McCabe, KMU8 News. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. And of course, the biggest race in the Show Me State is the race for governor. Uh, as soon as we get numbers, we will start posting them. Uh, the incumbent, Mike Parson, uh, is uh, running up against the state auditor, Nicole Galloway. KOMU8's Catherine Merck is live at Parson's Watch Party in Springfield. And Catherine, what is it like there? Hello, Jim. I'm here at the convention center at the Bass Pro Shop in Springfield where Governor Mike Parsons' watch party is about to go underway. Now, most of the day so far has been campaign staff and media getting ready for the events that are coming later tonight. Earlier today, I spoke with Parsons' communications director who talked about COVID-19 safety going on at the event tonight. So I'm gonna take, we're gonna take a look at the crowd that's here right now. If I can flip my camera around, you can see the first of the guests have started to trickle in. We have Fox News on in the background. Here is the podium where um, guest speakers will soon begin to start speaking and the governor will eventually speak. And there's the rest of the room there. Now the communications director told me that everyone here will be wearing masks. They're expecting about 250 people and they're wearing those masks because Springfield currently has a mask ordinance in place. Now behind me here, I did talk about how Governor Person will be speaking there. The guest speakers will start to speak at around eight o'clock. So for more updates on that, make sure to keep up with me on my Twitter at Catherine Merck TV and on KMU8 News' various social media accounts. But until then, reporting live in Springfield, this is Catherine Merck, KMU8 News. Catherine, thank you very much. And now let's talk about the challenger who wants to unseat the incumbent. KMU8's Aaron Davis joins us just a few blocks away at the Tiger Hotel here in downtown Columbia with Nicole Galloway's campaign. That's right, Jim. Tiger Hotel is the last stop in what Galloway's campaign has been describing as a long day. She started in St. Louis this morning at about 7.30 and is ending here with what was scheduled to start at 7 p.m. Right now, we're in a room with just reporters, as you can see, and because the public is not allowed inside due to COVID-19 restrictions. While we're, while we're down here, Galloway is upstairs in a room with her family awaiting the election results. And her campaign told us she's not planning on coming down until she knows them. The campaign also said they're really excited and have good mo feel like they have good momentum behind the energy that they've been feeling all day. If the election is called tonight, we'll have Galloway's speech live streamed on KLMU's Facebook, and you can follow along on Twitter at Aaron Davis News, as I'll be keeping people updated with what is going on down here. Reporting live in Columbia, Aaron Davis, KLMU 8 News. Okay, thank you very much for that live report. And now let's take a look at Amendment 3, the ballot initiative, which would reform voter-approved clean Missouri. Now, remember, the polls just closed, so we probably don't have numbers yet on Amendment 3. However, uh, KOMU 8's Elise Schoening has been following the returns, and she joins us now in the newsroom. Elise, what do you have for us? Well, that's right, Jim. With Amendment 3 in the ballot, many Missourians are asking the same question over what it would actually do. Now, to recap, the amendment would eliminate lobbyist gifts and lower campaign contribution limits, but also change the way the state is redistricted and who is in charge of that process. Now, Missourians have seen an amendment like this before, just back in 2018, which created the nonpartisan position currently in charge of redistricting the state. And if Amendment 3 passes, it will undo what 62% of Missourians voted for two years ago. Since redistricting happens every 10 years with the census, we wouldn't get to see what changes it will make here in Missouri. Supporters of this amendment are calling it Fair Missouri for giving Missourians a second chance to choose who will re represent them. And opponents 
proponents of the amendment are calling it dirty Missouri for confusing ballot language. And as you said, results are pouring in from across the state and we'll continue to bring you any updates on Amendment 3 at KLMU.com. And we'll also have reactions from both sides of the issue tonight on KLMU 8 News at 9 and 10. Reporting live from the station, Elise Schoenig, KLMU 8 News. Okay, Elise, thank you very much. And as we said earlier, we have reporters all across mid-Missouri and the entire state of Missouri. Here's a look at some of the other races our crews are following tonight. I'm Sydney Moran covering Vicki Hartzler as she runs for her fourth term to represent Missouri's fourth congressional district. She's a Missouri native, lifelong farmer, and a small business owner. She says this office requires somebody who has experience not only in office, but in real life. I'm Marion Bouchot and I'm covering Lindsay Simmons as she runs for her first congressional term in office. She attended Harvard Law School, worked as an attorney, and she wants her voters to know that she's married to an active duty military member. I spoke to Simmons and she says that this congressional race comes down to getting rid of someone who agrees so closely with President Donald Trump. I'm Alex Engel covering Caleb Browden's state Senate campaign. He's the current Senate Majority Leader and incumbent. He was previously a state representative. He says his record of results and experience is what makes him qualified to keep serving in Missouri. I'm Avery Everett covering the Judy Baker campaign for the Missouri State Senate. Baker is a Columbia native. She worked for the Missouri State House of Representatives and also the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. With COVID-19 as a top issue this election, Baker hopes voters will note her passion and dedication for public health. I'm Marina Silva covering the third district congressional race here in Missouri between Lane Luchtemeyer and Megan Rezevic. Luke Demeyer has held this seat since 2008, and he says he feels pretty good about how today will go. KMU8 has tried to reach out to Megan and has not heard back for two months. I'm Lauren Schwenker, and I have been following the Southern Boone County Commissioner seat. Republican Fred Perry is running again for his second term against Democratic nominee Justin Aldridge. Perry believes that he will be the best fit because he has the most experience. Perry was a former longtime magazine publisher and served on the Columbia Housing Authority as a commissioner. Justin Aldred is from Ashland and previously worked under state auditor Nicole Galloway. Aldred thinks he will be the best pick because he will bring more communication and transparency from the county government. I'm John Jenko covering the Boone County Commissioner Northern District race between Democratic incumbent Janet Thompson and Republican Tristan Asbury. Thompson is a former public defender who was first elected in 2012. She feels confident about the race today, saying her work funding internet hotspots and utility assistance shows her ability to address issues person by person. Asbury is a business owner in Boone County. We reached out to him multiple times throughout the day. We have not heard back. His campaign website says Asbury supports fiscally responsible county budgets and wants to see more money put towards the improvement of road infrastructure. Well, we do have a lot of reporters hitting the streets tonight. We have two guests standing by, Tracy wilson Camp from Race Matters Friends and professor and former White House correspondent Kathy Kiley will join us and we will be right back.
Well, once again, welcome back to our show. We're streaming on four different services, and I have two guests with me. Kathy Kiley is a professor at the journalism school here and also a former White House, uh, White House correspondent. Tracy wilson Claycamp. I first knew about 20 years ago, <laughs> something like that. You came here from Long Beach, California, because you had family here in mid-Missouri, and I appreciate both of you for being here. Let's just start off with what do you think about tonight's results. Uh, Tracy? I'm waiting. I'm not, uh, there's been a, I'm just waiting. I've been keeping myself busy and paying attention, but um, I actually have no expectations. I'm just going to wait like Christmas. Kathy? I think that's, uh, Tracy's probably pretty smart uh, because it looks like, I think the Democrats were really hoping for a blowout in Florida or something really decisive. It doesn't look like that's happening. And that would suggest that we're in for a long night and maybe a long week. How, how could this election affect your group and what you, you want to accomplish here in Columbia and Boone County? I think um, it's already affecting us, um, and it has been affecting us, and that is, I think, um, really not an interest in this country in terms of atonement and reconciliation and an understanding of history. I think we're a very ahistorical country. Um, so we'll still be fighting that battle locally, but I think uh, it's going to take people probably at the higher echelons for to really get it. that these changes need to happen. We really need to come together as a country. And we can be right, right, left, and center, but not in the way that we are right now. Kathy, if, if Nicole Galloway wins tonight, she would become the first Missouri female governor. What does that mean to the state? Well, I think any time uh, anytime you crack the glass ceiling, uh, it's very meaningful both to, uh, to obviously the winner of the election, but, mm -hmm. uh, but also to younger women. I think it helps uh, recruit uh, women to the political process, which is important. Um, but, uh, you know, it would, uh, it, anytime you have a historical barrier broken like that, I think it's really meaningful, not just in the state, but also around the country. Tracy, defund the police and back the blue, uh, polar opposites. Uh, what needs to be done, and, and, and will this election create some help? Or, or what? But what needs to be done there? So first, I think we have to get away from kind of gotcha phrases. You know, we say defund the police, and everyone gets really excited. And actually, the conversation is how can we spend our, spend our money differently? How can we prioritize? And that whole idea of change and transformation is really difficult for people. But it's quite obvious that what we're doing isn't working. And if we're spending way more on policing and we spend a fraction on health and human services, the disparities are there, it's obvious. And so we have to shift our mindset and ask ourselves, is this really working? And I think there hasn't been the political will to ask those questions. And so um, we, 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 we make the people who are asking for change the boogeyman rather than the people who have the most power who can change to actually come to the table and, and have, those hard, have, have those hard conversations. Kathy, four years ago, uh, President, uh, now President Trump was not supposed to win. What happened four years ago tonight? Well, I think people forgot about the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people looked at the polls, and the polls showed Hillary Clinton winning nationally. And in fact, she did win nationally. She won the popular vote. Uh, but what people don't uh, fail to understand is that in our country, um, the way the Constitution set things up, um, it really favors states uh, with states that have more geography than population have a little bit of an excess, uh, a, a little bit of an excess uh, uh, say in the in the election. And so, what happened is that the polls were pretty much on on point, but people didn't realize that in certain states that were very closely fought, um, a narrow victory meant. All of those electoral votes went to Donald Trump, and our election is decided by the Electoral College, not the popular vote. Is the Electoral College still needed? Well, that is a really good question. Uh, I think it's funny. I tried to write about this when I was working for USA Today in 2000, after an election that year was decided by the Electoral College. And it was funny how reluctant people were to even talk about the subject, as if it were somehow disloyal that you were somehow casting aspersions on the winner of that year's election. 
But I do think it's something we, we have to think about. And I think it's not just our Electoral College, it's the Senate. Both bodies are set up to really, uh, they disfavor heavily urban areas where the populations are now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at electoral maps, it looks like it, you can see these clusters of population are voting one way and the rest of the country is voting another way. And in some ways, I think, um, not to say anything, I, I don't think we've resolved our race problems in any way, but in some ways, the biggest gap in our country is between urban and rural right now. Tracy, if Joe Biden wins tonight, Kamala Harris becomes the first vice president of color. What would that mean for this country? It would mean, uh, again, seeing a woman of color in the White House. And again, people will probably go through some of the things that they went through before, this difficulty of seeing a woman of color in the White House. I think what really matters is the work that goes with it. What will they be doing as a team? And will she be able to help uh, Joe Biden uh, change the conversations that we have in our country? You were talking about the Electoral College and not wanting to change. That's something that's, I think, really wound uh, deeply into this country. We have this tradition. And I think that we need to start breaking some of those traditions, not just to throw them away, but to open them up and say, hmm, you know what, I, maybe this needs to be tweaked. Maybe this needs to be different. The other and, thing, and they I, would represent that. The two of them would represent doing something yeah. different. Well, the other thing I would just interject to say is that um, it really would give Kamala Harris a leg up to be the first woman president because it's almost a dead certainty that, that if Biden wins, mm -hmm. he's a one-term president because of his age. age. So sure. um, she'd be teed up uh, in a way that, and that could make history too. Is the city going, to, the city of Columbia, is it improving? I think they're very stuck in their ways. I think they're very good at doing performance. Um, and habit and tradition. It's very hard to change the, the structure. Like you're talking about the electoral, these are all structural things. And breaking structures is very hard um, because it means I'm gonna lose power somewhere. And the idea of sharing power with people is almost uh, you know, a crime um, in the way a lot of our systems run. But I think that's the key to it is shifting the way that we use power and, and, and what does it benefit and who is it for. What is your mission personally and your group's mission? Our, our mission of our group has really been to get white people to come to the table and be activists and learn to be allies and learn to be advocates and speak truth to power, right? It, this has always been put on black people as a burden and really racism is a white people problem. And so we want white people to feel comfortable learning to have those conversations, moving past, feeling uncomfortable so that they can speak to their friends and their family and other politicians about ways that they can move out of that sort of unstuck zone of, I'm wedded to this because I'm afraid if I change, I'm gonna lose all my power, right? And that's hard. Uh, Donald Trump won Missouri by a wide margin uh, four years ago. Um, neither he nor Joe Biden campaigned in <coughs> Missouri uh, in the past few months. Uh, is Missouri a lock when it comes to Donald Trump tonight? I would think so. I mean, I think the fact that you not only, you didn't see um, either candidate here and um, you didn't see them spending money here on television ads. So uh, they Someone both... Someone knows. Go ahead. Yeah. They've, they've both written this off. I mean, they've both decided uh, ahead of time. I think, um, and I think that will make it more difficult for Nicole Galloway. Uh, I think when you have a competitive presidential race, it helps, t it helps candidates up and down the ticket. You're reading my mind because my next question was, if things are a little tighter this year than they were four years ago, will that be a positive reflection on Nicole Galloway? Well, it, it could be. I think the biggest factor, though, in, in this year's race is COVID, I mean, and how people respond to it. It is the big X factor in this campaign. Um, so I think, you know, it's funny, I was, I remember in 2008, I was covering Barack Obama's campaign for USA Today, and we were here in Missouri, we were in Roy Blunt's district, um, and, and he came very close to winning that race. So at one point, Missouri was much more competitive, and uh, it's changed a lot. 
Kathy, Tracy, thank you very much. I got to do a little business here. If you're just joining us on our special live stream show, we welcome you and we have a lot more to come with our guests. But first, my colleague Emily Spain is standing by at KOMU with an update on the Missouri races. As for us here in the RJI studios, we will be right back. Well, the polls across the state have officially closed and we are waiting for those re returns to begin pouring in. Good evening, I'm Emily Spain. Thanks for sticking with KOMU Wade News for your Smart Decision 2020 coverage. We have teams of reporters following races across the state tonight. Let's check in first with KOMU Wade's Tyler Drazinga, who's at the Boone County Clerk's office. Tyler. Yeah, Emily, polls closed at 7 o'clock tonight, but any person in line at that time is allowed to vote. Now, you can see all the tables and the carts behind me. As ballots from polling locations come in over the next half hour or so, they'll be checked in here and then sent up to the second floor to the county clerk's office to be tabulated. The clerk's office has worked closely with a local post office to make sure that they got all the mail-in ballots that were turned in before 7 o'clock tonight. Workers started tabulating absentees and mail-ins at 6.15 this morning. They were caught up by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Boone County Clerk Brianna Lennon says unofficial results will be posted on the website as soon as possible, and that timing depends on how quickly those polling locations can get the results back to this building. Reporting live in Columbia, Tyler Driesinga, KOMU 8 News. One of the ballot measures voters decided on today, Amendment 3, which would reform voter-approved Clean Missouri. Kaomi Waits, Caroline Reeves here in the studio with us to tell us more about Amendment 3 and break it all down. Caroline? Emily, let's break down exactly what it means to reform Amendment 1, also known as Clean Missouri. If passed, this amendment would change the state's redistricting criteria that was voted in 2018 with 62% of the vote. We haven't even seen Amendment 1 in action yet, and if Amendment 3 passes, we never will. In the studio, Caroline Reeby, KMU8 News. Of course, one of the big races tonight for the governor is uh, between Mike Parson and Nicole Galloway, still waiting for those results to come in. Again, polls just closed at 7 o'clock, just within the past half hour. Let's take a look at the, the candidates. Parsons campaign had a bus tour in the final moments before Election Day, making 33 stops total. He is pushing his COVID-19 locally focused plan and efforts to help Missouri's economy. Parson also made his support for law enforcement very clear. Galloway's big target has been on current Governor Mike Parson's response to the pandemic. She says it's just not good enough. Governor Parson's supporters have tried to attack Galloway as having a liberal agenda up. State Auditor has said that she's focused on Missouri families, especially touting her plans to expand Medicaid coverage. We were reporting results all night during NBC's special coverage, and you can find the latest numbers, of course, on the bottom of your screen. We'll also have a special edition of KOMU Wade News streaming on our website and the KOMU Wade mobile news app right now. Well, welcome back. Kathy Kiley and I are now joined with political science professor Peveril Squire, who is joining us by Skype. And Dr. Squire, we thank you for joining us on such an important night. The polls closed here in mid-Missouri about 30 minutes ago. But while we wait for numbers to start coming in, we want to talk about the big decisions tonight. Let's talk about the gubernatorial race. Your thoughts on Mike Parson and Nicole Galloway. Well, we would assume that uh, Parson would be the favorite, given that uh, Republicans have been doing well in Missouri for the last couple of election cycles. But as we know, this is an extraordinary year. Uh, and of course, both Parson and, and Galloway uh, initially got to their current positions by being appointed rather than elected. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen. We'll have to see what turnout was like in uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, and, and how the suburbs outside of St. Louis go. Kathy, um, when I was a kid growing up in Jefferson City, a Republican could not get elected in Missouri. And now, you know, now I'm about ready to retire, and now a Democrat can't get elected in Missouri. W why the flip? 
You know, um, I think uh, it's, it's been building for a long time. I think uh, part of it is, it, it's a pendulum swing, uh, which happens in U.S. politics. And um, I think, as I was saying earlier before the break, I mean, I was here in 2008 and Barack Obama seriously competed for the state and nearly won. But I think uh, some of it, I think, frankly, is a reaction to Barack Obama. Uh, some of it is, I think, um, that the Republican Party, uh, going way back to the Nixon years, uh, has made a concerted play for disaffected white male voters and has been very effective in that. But the pendulum does swing, and uh, I, you know, I covered uh, Congress for a long time for a newspaper in Texas, and it was stunning in the 1980s when Texas got more than two Republican congressmen, and now they're dominated by Republicans, and yet. Texas is being talked about as one of the most competitive states mm -hmm. uh, in this race. So pendulums swing back and forth in U.S. politics all the time. Peveril, I want to ask you a question, and that would be, since 1904, Missouri voters have voted for the winning president all but three times, 1956 and then the two times with Barack Obama. Uh, why, why do Missouri, are Missouri voters just that mainstream or what? Well, we've always been here in the middle of the country and, and for a long time representative of a lot of what's going on around the nation. And of course, we're both urban and rural and we have suburban areas, so we're a, a good mix of, of, of the country. I, I think at this point, we're uh, certainly a, a statewide uh, Democrats can be competitive. Maybe you break it down by state legislative districts and the, and the Democrats have a much harder time uh, winning a lot of seats uh, at, at that level. Uh, but it's it's a state that, uh, at least at the the, the statewide level, uh, Democrats can see some path to victory. It, it's probably not a terribly good path, uh, but they can at least be competitive. Professor Squire, let's ask about a state senate race between Caleb Rowden and Judy Baker right here in Columbia. Uh, this has been, of course, one of the the two hot state senate races uh, in uh, Missouri this year. Uh, anybody who's watched TV over the last couple of weeks have seen uh, lots and lots of ads from both candidates, uh, both from their uh, campaigns and, and from outsiders spending money to try to influence uh, the election. Uh, it's a seat where Boone uh, carries a lot of weight, Boone County, uh, but Cooper County swung it to uh, Caleb Rowden four years ago. Uh, and we'll have to see what uh, Boone County turnout is like given uh, the pandemic. Uh, and also whether uh, Cooper County will supply the kinds of numbers that Rowden needs to, uh, to get reelected. Kathy, your thoughts on that same question. Is Missouri just plain mainstream? Well, it's, a, you know, Missouri's a lot like another state that is competitive uh, tonight, which is Pennsylvania. It's, Pennsylvania's my home state. It's where I started my political career. And what you really have uh, in uh, states like these are microcosms of the country. I talked earlier about the urban divide, uh, rural divide, and you have two major metropolitan areas bookending the state, uh, and in between you have areas that are much more rural. So it's always, it's, a, it's really a great slice of American life that you can uh, see all kinds of people uh, industrial America and parts of uh, St. Louis, post-industrial America, and, uh, and the farmlands as well. So I think states like this tend to be battlegrounds because they are such a mix. If you watched Weather IQ tonight at 6 o'clock, you would know weather does affect the outcomes of elections. But sadly, so does negative TV ads. Why? I call it the pogo problem. Uh, remember uh, the cartoon Pogo, who would, but sometimes Pogo would walk up to the mirror on the funny page and say, we have met the enemy and it is us. So people say they hate negative advertising, but negative advertising works. And until we as voters ensure that it doesn't work by voting against people who indulge in it, we are going to keep being bombarded by negative advertising. Um, and I've been really struck. Uh, by some of the local races, how very negative they've been, and it's discouraging. Uh, and we're seeing also a lot of negativity and disinformation on uh, social media, too. Professor Squire, uh, Mike Parson does not want a statewide mask mandate. Nicole Galloway does. 
your thoughts on that? I, I think COVID and, and, and the pandemic is, of course, uh, one of the major issues confronting every campaign uh, this uh, election season. I think we'll have to see how particularly um, people in the suburbs respond to uh, Governor Parson and his uh, sort of lackadaisical approach to uh, to confronting the pandemic. He's, he's really shifted the burden for making tough decisions onto local government leaders. And, and we've seen a lot of local government leaders in, uh, around the state who have uh, picked up that challenge and have uh, instituted some mask mandates. But of course, at this point, we see a number spiking in Missouri the last couple of weeks, uh, they've been going up rather dramatically. And so we'll have to wait and see to what extent uh, voters uh, put that into their calculus when they made their decision about which gubernatorial candidate to uh, to support. I, I, I think if Galloway is to pull out an upset, uh, it may largely be based on people being uh, disappointed with uh, with the governor's performance on that particular issue. Professor Squire, given that Governor Parson was not elected governor four years ago, he was elected lieutenant governor, uh, does that play a factor this year or not? Well, I think it does. He, uh, he ran a statewide campaign for lieutenant governor, but frankly, most of us don't pay uh, close attention to the candidates in, in that particular contest. Uh, and so I, I think he had to establish sort of his own independent identity and introduce himself to a lot of people around the state. They're familiar with him having taken over since uh, Governor Greitens stepped down. Uh, but it's not the same thing as, as having run a campaign and asked for people's votes and, and gotten them. So I, I think it, it's been a, a challenge for him. Uh, Galloway has uh, won one statewide race, but uh, it was a, a tougher race than it probably should have been two years ago. Uh, and so both candidates came in uh, to this campaign uh, without really being well known by a lot of voters around the state. And so they had to both uh, uh, introduce themselves and, and try to uh, characterize their opponent's uh, uh, challenges and, and weaknesses in a way that uh, made them the preferred candidate. And, and, and that's not easy to do at a time when uh, the presidential campaign is, is really gathering most of the, the public and the media's attention. I think uh, COVID actually cut both ways for Parson. Um, it's a tough challenge for any leader to take on, and, um, and any leader is going to bear the brunt of blame for whatever problems there are. But it also put him out there front and center. He was having press conferences every day. And, uh, and so I think that, in some ways, addressed some of the uh, name recognition issues um, that my colleague just talked about here. So I think um, it, it, it was a double-edged sword for Mike Parson. What are the key states? I mean, if there are two or three states that one of the candidates must win tonight, what would be the three? Should we just throw out Florida? I mean, should it be just simply at the top of the on list? Its, on its own? Yeah. Um, well, Florida is obviously an important state. Um, I think the, the real battleground states that everyone's been talking about and the candidates themselves have been focused on these last uh, the last week of the campaign, we may not know because uh, Pennsylvania is a state that uh, they can't even start counting the early votes until tonight. And so there are a number of states like that that we may not know. The other states that people are watching for are some of the states that um, Trump should win easily. And if he doesn't, that may give us a signal of um, early problems for the president. Um, Texas is a state that people are going to look at. Uh, which we were talking about earlier, um, Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia. I would say if the president is even, uh, is just even not, has a, doesn't have a great lead in those states, is down to single percentage points, uh, that might be um, a bad sign for him and a hopeful sign for the Biden folks. But some of these battlegrounds, it may be tomorrow or the next day before we really know. Could lawsuits from the East Coast to the West Coast bog down this election process and make it take weeks, maybe even months? Yes. Uh, I just saw before I came in here that supporters of the president's filed a suit in Nevada, which is another uh, battleground state, uh, to try to stop the counting of early votes. Um, I think if the results are decisive, if it's a decisive win for one candidate or another, you won't see so much of that.
but I think the closer this is, the more chance that each side is going to be looking for advantages on the margins, and that's going to mean lawsuits. Professor Squire, if, if the virus is the number one factor in the governor's race, uh, what are some of the others? I'm thinking maybe education, violent crime. What would be your thoughts? Well, certainly the, the governor's campaign tried to, to pitch crime as, as being one of the, the centerpieces uh, for them. And, and it, it looked back in uh, perhaps May and June that, uh, that it might be a particularly important issue. I think, again, it has gotten swept aside by just the reality of, of the pandemic and, and uh, the impact that has had on, on education and on the economy. Uh, and so everything sort of revolves around the pandemic and, and people's perspectives on on how it ought to be addressed and uh, and how it's uh, sort of byproducts and, and damage uh, also need to be redressed. Um, so crime is certainly not an issue that uh, can be ignored in Missouri. Uh, we have had a number of problems here in Columbia uh, and um, most of the other uh, major urban areas, but I'm not sure it's going to be uh, probably one of the motivating factors for how people make their final decision. Professor Squire, uh, Governor Parson touted his law enforcement background over and over and over. Uh, what, does, what do the voters, what do Missourians think about that? Well, I think he was pitching himself to his rural base and, and that's where he was comfortable. He'd been elected uh, sheriff a number of times. Um, and, and those are the people that he's comfortable with and those are the people he was uh, banking on having their support carrying him into uh, uh, a full elected term. It's a little hard to talk about in different places because it means different things to different Missourians. Uh, it also suggests that perhaps he was uh, not really working hard to get votes in St. Louis and Kansas City and, and, and maybe just hoping that the suburbs were going to get swept in and, and in a series of, of worries about, about crime. Uh, again, it's, it has, for the most part, receded from the headlines, and uh, we've been talking about other things. So I, I think it was an easy thing for him to talk about. It's an issue that uh, Republicans generally own. Uh, he had his own personal background in that area, so it was natural for him to, uh, uh, to talk about it. Uh, I'm not sure that it uh, did much beyond uh, sort of reinforce his support among his base. Okay, I'm going to do the same question for both of you. And Kathy, I want you to take a look at the presidential angle and Professor Squire at the gubernatorial race. And that question is, if you look back four years ago, uh, generally Democrats only win the city of St. Louis, Jackson County, sometimes St. Louis County, but not always, and then Boone County. I'll start with you, Kathy. Will, will that change in the presidential race uh, tonight? I would say only if there's a blue tsunami. Um, I think uh, this gets back to the urban-rural divide that we were talking about earlier. And, um, and I think even what Professor Squire said about uh, Governor Parson's uh, efforts to appeal to his base, I think we've really sorted ourselves um, ideologically and geographically into foxholes. I don't know what it's going to take to get us out of that. Maybe COVID will, uh, because people are going to maybe start looking outside of big cities uh, for places to live. But, uh, but right now, I think it's um, kind of sadly a little predictable. Professor Squire, what about the gubernatorial race? Well, I'd say that's probably a, a good guess, as, as always, although I, I would suggest that maybe uh, Greene County might be someplace where if we see any a growth in, in Democratic support. It might uh, show up there first uh, around Springfield. Um, otherwise, I, I think at this point, and until the Democrats can uh, figure out a way to, to talk and connect with rural voters, uh, we'll have these islands of Democratic support surrounded by a, a sea of Republican red uh, in, in most of, uh, of the state. Peveril, Kathy, thank you very much for your time. I am now joined by my colleague, Emily Spain, who is live in the KOMU studio. And Emily, what's going on there? Presidential candidates, and obviously very too uh, early to tell anything, really. NBC has um, so far Biden with 51 electoral college votes and Trump with 42. Co of course, again, that's according to NBC's projections. One state they're really uh, 
watching closely, obviously you guys were just talking about it, Florida, and right now there are 90%, 91% of precincts reporting and Trump currently holding the lead there with 50.6% of the votes and Biden with 48.4% of the votes in Florida. And obviously that's a big state, 29 electoral votes in Florida, so one that uh, folks are closely watching tonight. Also taking a look at Texas, it's another state 38 electoral votes, and right now Biden is holding the lead there. Of course, just 62% of precincts reporting. Biden holding the lead with 50.8% of the votes, and Trump at 47.8% of the votes in um, Texas. So those are two of those big states hold a lot of weight with the Electoral College. Um, also, folks are keeping an eye on Ohio and Pennsylvania. Remember, both Biden and Trump spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania um, for the uh, final few days of the campaign. Right now, there's only 10% reporting in Pennsylvania with Biden in the lead with 65.1% of the vote and 34.2% of the vote with Trump. But again, just 10% of the votes report of the precincts reporting in Pennsylvania. Another state uh, that has a lot of eyes is Ohio, 18 electoral votes up for grabs there with Trump at 43.9%, Biden leading with 54.9%. 49% of precincts reporting. So we're starting to get an, uh, an idea of how the votes are falling along the East Coast and moving into the Midwest. You know, um, the polls to our West are still open until 9 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit more time to vote in um, to our West and then uh, all the way on the West Coast, you know, polls don't close in California until 10 o'clock. Uh, Central Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. So still a lot of time for things to play out. A lot of votes still left to count. And um, as you all were talking about, you know, this could go into a few days from now. We might not know exactly um, a for sure winner tonight. But again, a lot of talk about Florida right now with 90% uh, of the precincts in. They've, uh, NBC News has spent a lot of time focusing in on the Miami-Dade area, um, which Hillary Clinton won um, easily in 2016, but the margin between the two candidates in 2020 a little bit more slim than in 2016. So still waiting for um, votes to come in here in Missouri. We only have 3% of precincts re reporting in Missouri, but I'll tell you what we got so far. 10 electoral votes up for grabs in our home state here in Missouri. Biden leading 51.3%, Trump um, with 47.5%, but again, just 3% of precincts reporting. So votes are just starting to trickle in in Missouri as polls closed about 45 minutes ago but uh, remember if you were in line at seven you still were able to vote so Jim a lot going on here in the newsroom bunch of crews out there reporting for us and we'll have another um, update for folks uh, watching the NBC coverage coming up here in about oh, seven minutes or so okay Emily thank you very much as we continue to watch the votes come in we also want to mention that there is more information about the path to the 270 electoral college votes from our very own KOMU8's Megan Judy. The focus today will not necessarily be on who's winning the most individual votes, but instead where these votes are coming from. Both Trump and Biden are on the road to secure 270 electoral college votes. Once a candidate reaches this, they win the presidency. The state's number of senators and representatives combined is the number of electors a state gets. You can see here Missouri gets 10 electors. Many states historically overwhelmingly vote for one party. For example, California is expected to vote Democratic, North Dakota is expected to vote Republican. These states are pretty well already decided. That leaves these battleground states. We have combed through numerous news outlets and political analysis. These are the overarching trends. The most crucial states for President Trump are Florida and Pennsylvania. He needs to claim both and hold on to North Carolina and Arizona, two states he narrowly won in 2016. President Trump also has to keep Georgia. 
Texas, which is now a toss-up state, and Ohio. These are states Biden has more of a competitive advantage. Trump's campaign is also pouring time and money into Wisconsin and Michigan. These states historically are Democratic, but Trump flipped both four years ago. He still has to defend Iowa and Maine's second district. He also has to flip Nevada and Minnesota. These two states voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. But if President Trump does not flip Nevada and Minnesota, then Georgia becomes important for Biden. If Biden wins Georgia, Michigan and Wisconsin, he'll have enough votes to win. These are just a few of the paths Trump and Biden have, but all eyes will be on these states today as votes start to come in. Okay, thank you very much, Megan Judy. And uh, we're going to try and maybe get some results here just very quickly if we can. In the meantime, Kathy, I want to ask you about uh, a term that was coined four years ago, and it was fake news. Now, tell us your what your definition of fake news is and, and how much of a, a, a factor is fake news in tonight's election? Well, it's a big factor. Uh, it's, a, it's been a big factor, I'll say, in this campaign. Um, but I would say that um, I, it's a term that a lot of people who are in the news business don't like to use because it's been co-opted. Um, fake news to too many people means news that I don't like. And, um, but, what, uh, but what we're really talking about here is news that is wholly made up. And I think it's important for viewers to understand that um, reputable news organizations like KOMU um, go out, try to find the news based on facts, and when we make a mistake, which sometimes we do, we correct that mistake. That says to our audience that we care about the reputations of the people we cover and we care about the reputations of ourselves, our reporters. So I think what people need to understand is there's a difference between an error um, there and, and deliberate misinformation or disinformation. And that's what we're seeing a lot of and we're seeing it on social media. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse social media with professional media. That's another message I would give our audience. In the past four years, I've had just complete strangers come up to me and say, I'm just so tired of, of the political scene. Yet today in Missouri, we had a huge turnout of voters. What gives? I think that's great that we had a huge turnout of voters. I think it's really great. Um, I think one of the things that we know uh, about disinformation is that just like any technology, digital technology has a good side and a bad side. And it can be used for the bad. Uh, disinformation and propaganda are being put out on it. What we need to do is not get so sick that we give up. The enemies of democracy want us to say, oh, they're all alike, I give up, I can't tell fake news from what's real. And if we do that, uh, we are giving in to the enemies of democracy. Kathy, I've got something here behind me. Uh, we've got unofficial turnout numbers for Boone County uh, after the polls closed 63,000 in-person ballots cast and then 28 1,649 absentee ballots. Um, so it looks like we've got about 79% uh, of the active voters and about six, almost 70%. Wow, almost 80% yeah, of, of active voters, yeah. Uh, yes, of the active voters and then about 70% of the eligible voters. What does that tell you? Because that's exactly what we were just talking about. Well, it says people care about this election and people are getting out and exercising their franchise and that is a great thing for democracy. We touched briefly on the debates and, and the first one was called the dumpster fire. Did, did did either one of those two debates, did they sway any voters whatsoever? I don't think so. Uh, what we're seeing in the exit polls tonight, I was looking at the NBC site before we came in here, is that an awful lot of people made up their minds weeks ago. Uh, and I mean even before the debates. And I think that is a reflection of, of number one, the length of our campaigns, but also um, this campaign is really a referendum on the sitting president. And he's been there for four years. And it's not just that he's president of the United States. He has this huge larger than life personality. So people are going to make up their minds about him. You know, they've probably made up their minds about him years ago. 
And so I'm, I'm not sure the debates had any impact at all. Well, once again, I appreciate your time, and I want to remind everyone that uh, we are streaming on four different services, KOMU.com, the KOMU mobile app, Roku, and Apple TV. Uh, we are going to be taking a break here and heading back to NBC, I believe, in just a few minutes, just a few seconds from now. So let's do that. Thanks for watching KLM Rate News for your Smart Decision 2020 coverage tonight. I'm Emily Spain. Let's dive right in to one of the races the whole state will be watching closely, the race for Missouri governor. We have teams of reporters at Governor Parson and Nicole Galloway's watch parties tonight. Let's first check in with KLM Rate's Annabelle Thorpe, who is live in Springfield at Governor Parson's event. Annabelle? Emily, the crowd definitely has an excited buzz about it. Just take a look at the tables behind me. There's not a single empty table in this entire room. That's because the formal event begins in just moments at 8 p.m. Speakers will take this stage behind me and switch out about every 30 minutes or so. Governor Parson, however, is not expected to take the stage until the race is called. A few moments ago, I spoke with Governor Parson's campaign manager about the bus tour he just completed. The campaign manager told me he reached out to both Democrats and Republicans across the state in a bipartisan effort. There wasn't one specific county they focused on. The campaign manager also told me that they are cautiously optimistic heading into tonight. I'll have another update for you tonight at 10 o'clock on KMU 8 News. Until then, reporting in Springfield, Annabelle Thorpe, KMU 8 News. Okay, thank you, Annabelle. Kalmy Bates, Ian Russell joins us now live in Columbia for Nicole Galloway's watch party. And Ian, what's it been like there so far? Well, Emily, yeah, campaign officials have told us that Galloway is not going to make an appearance until the race is called. And that same campaign official told me that currently she's upstairs watching the results with their family. Now, normally there'd be a lot of people here, a lot of supporters, but this year it's really just not the case. This room is almost totally empty. Instead, it's just members of the media and her campaign team. That's it. No one else is allowed inside. That's, of course, due to COVID-19 safety. And that's really something that Nicole Galloway has been pushing since the start of the pandemic and something she's been very critical of of her opponent, current Governor Mike Parson. Now, whenever Nicole Galloway does make an appearance, you can catch it right here on Channel 8, and you can also catch it over on our website, KOMU.com. Reporting live in Columbia, I'm Ian Russell, KOMU 8 News. Okay, thanks, Ian. One of the ballot measures voters decided on today, Amendment 3, which would reform voter-approved Clean Missouri. In 2018, voters passed Amendment 1 with 62% of the vote. If passed tonight, Amendment 3 would change the state's redistricting criteria. We haven't seen Amendment 1 in action, and if Amendment 3 passes this evening, we never will. The polls now been closed for almost an hour, but for anyone who was in line at 7, it's still fair game. The Boone County Clerk's Office has worked with the post office to make sure all the mail-in ballots were in before 7. Absentee and mail-in ballots were all tabulated by late this afternoon. We'll have the latest numbers from across the state on the bottom of your screen throughout the night. We'll also have a special edition of KLME Wade News streaming on our website and on our app right now. Back to NBC's national coverage.
Well, welcome back to this special edition of KOMU 8 News. Once again, I'm joined by former White House correspondent and journalism professor Kathy Kiley, but I'm also joined by political science professor Mitchell McKinney via Skype. And Professor McKinney, how are you doing this evening? I'm great, Jim. How are you? <laughs> what are your takes in the early going? I mean, the polls just closed an hour ago here in Missouri, and your opening thoughts? Well, naturally, you know, what I've seen, it doesn't look like there's any sort of uh, so-called blue wave. Uh, that might suggest that this is going to be uh, yet another nail biter. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at a states, we'll be looking at a very close margin, and so that might mean uh, maybe not even a late night, it may be more protracted in, in the next few days. Talk to us about the differences between Joe Biden as a candidate tonight and Hillary Clinton four years ago. Well, when, when you look at some of the uh, county by county in the key states, uh, some of the, the, the returns at, at this point, uh, in some of those key counties and key states, it looks like perhaps that Joe Biden is uh, uh, ahead of what Hillary Clinton was pulling in several of those counties and several of those states, again, by uh, two, three, four, five per percentage point. Um, and then when you drill down and you look at, uh, say, for example, North Carolina in the states that are heavily African-American voters, where Hillary Clinton didn't pull as well as Barack Obama did in, in both of his uh, uh, runs, in both of his elections, that uh, there's some early evidence that, again, in key states and key areas with key voters, Biden may uh, be doing a little better. So, so I think then the question is overall statewide, uh, will we say at the end of the night or again, uh, when this is all over in the next day or two, uh, did he do well enough? Kathy, same question for you. The biggest difference between Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton is that Joe Biden is a man. And I hate to say it, but uh, misogyny is very much a factor in, uh, in elections. And um, you don't have to be uh, a male to be a misogynist. Uh, there are still a lot of people in this country who um, uh, have a hard time with the idea of women and power. And I just say this because I covered politics for decades and I saw it over and over again. I think um, women candidates have a much harder, a much steeper hill to climb uh, than male candidates do. And to the extent that Joe Biden is outperforming Hillary Clinton, I think um, that is one of the biggest factors. Mitchell, what is your response to what Kathy just said? Well, I, I think there, there's, it's certainly, uh, uh, if we, once we see the outcome here and we go back and we look four years ago uh, to try to explain, uh, again, in those states that Hillary Clinton was expected to do well, or at least carry, that then uh, went uh, 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 to, to, to uh, Donald Trump, uh, we, we saw heavily voting by males, as, as Kathy has suggested, uh, where I think that interpretation, in terms of a bottom line, uh, trying to explain what happened four years ago, uh, certainly carries water in terms of looking at the vote, the outcome of the vote, uh, who voted, who opted for Donald Trump. Uh, so, so uh, again, I'm, I'm anxious to see uh, in terms of the breakdown after we get through tonight or in the next day or two. But, but certainly, uh, I think that's a very spot on interpretation of what happened four years ago with Hillary Clinton. Mitchell, did the debate four uh, years ago, did, did that sway any voters? And did the two debates between Biden and Trump, did, did those sway any voters? Yeah. You know, four years ago, uh, what we saw in terms of the three debate series between Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Donald Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton performed very well in those debates. Um, she, she was able to actually increase her margin a bit, particularly following the first debate, but also the second debate, uh, the town hall debate. That was the debate immediately after the TMZ tape uh, was released. She came out of that debate series, I think, in a strong position. Now, what happens uh, in a campaign is the campaign continues. 
Uh, and then it was the Comey testimony, uh, uh, the Comey uh, uh, report and, and the emails that, that intervened after the debate series and before election uh, that really, I think, affected uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, standing where she then started to lose ground, went into the election nationally at about a three point, um, the, the average of polls had her about a three point uh, lead. Now. She won the popular vote, of course, by two and a half, not quite three points. So the debates helped her. It's just the camp other factors in the campaign worked against her. What we saw in this race, uh, and particularly the first debate, uh, was immediately after, 24 hours, 48, after, uh, 48 hours after that first debate, uh, a downturn by about a point to two points in Donald Trump's uh, average tracking poll and an upturn uh, in, in Joe Biden, uh, in his performance in that first debate. Uh, there was very little movement after their, la their, their second uh, debate, uh, but there was some indication, Jim, that that first debate really did, uh, did not uh, fare well for Donald Trump, hurt him in terms of the average tracking poll, and helped uh, Joe Biden a bit. Kathy, if Kathy. Joe Biden is the next president, what will the average American see different initially? Probably the most different thing would be the handling of the COVID um, crisis. And I think, uh, and again, we talk about that cutting both ways. I think for Biden, that cuts both ways. Um, I think a lot of people are tired of COVID, and we all are, and they're tired of the preventive measures. So when you have a candidate who is talking about a national mask mandate, uh, some people may think that's a great idea and it may cause other people to react against it. But I think you would see uh, certainly a bigger aid package for workers. Uh, the Republican Party has resisted that. Um, and uh, I think you'd see um, a, certainly a lot more emphasis on uh, pushing health care out uh, to uh, to Americans. But again, uh, these are things that cut both ways with um, with voters, and I think we're seeing that tonight. Mitchell, same question to you. What will be the first thing that the average American sees different? Well, I think Kathy is, is, is absolutely correct because Joe Biden, the linchpin, the cornerstone of his campaign, again, if he's elected, if he's our next president, uh, I think it's January 21, 22, uh, we will not be out of the COVID season. Uh, and that will be the reason that he's elected president is comparing his, uh, his, his projected handling of the COVID crisis versus Donald Trump. And, and, and so voters will be ready. Uh, we will be likely going into a crucial period. Uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, bring the virus under some control, but when we get to the point of, of, of a vaccine and how that rolls out and, and who has access and all, all of those questions, uh, it could be rather fatal for Joe Biden to step in having campaigned on this issue and, and we see f to flub uh, how, how, again, the vaccines rolled out or, or are we getting control of it? So that's going to be priority one uh, for Joe Biden. Mitchell, do the Democrats take over the U.S. Senate tonight? You, you know, uh, we're early indications, and I'm thinking now about North Carolina, for example, suggest that there is a possibility that that's going to happen. Uh, and, and, and Jim, if it does, to your last question, uh, it really, and, and, and I think everyone assumes that the Democrats will maintain, if not grow, their, their margin uh, in the House. But uh, uh, if Joe Biden is elected and if, if Democrats take over the Senate, then we have Demo the national government uh, will, will be run by Democrats in terms of the two chambers of the Congress and, and, the, and the executive. Uh, that puts a great burden on the decision making, on how effective are they at governing and, and leading the nation. Uh, there will be no excuses in terms of, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's the other party, right? Voters are going to say, you're in charge. Uh, and, and so, uh, although I'm sure uh, D Democrats look at that as, you know, they, they, they want to, main, uh, to gain control of the Senate, and if they do, then uh, they've got some great responsibility going forward. Kathy, the Republicans talk about a socialist movement. Um, yes or no? Well, I think to follow up, uh, I think sure. one of the biggest challenges, and it, it addresses your question, is 
for the Democrats, if they were to take complete control, White House, Senate, and House, um, they really have to decide, do they want to be as radical as the Republicans were in pressing their advantage? Uh, because here you saw, uh, really, it's, it's as somebody who's covered Washington for a long time, what happened with the Supreme Court was a classic example of that, not allowing a vote on President Obama's nominee, but then pushing on a really fast train. I mean, I've never seen a Supreme Court nomination uh, move that quickly. So I think the question is going to be, are Democrats so mad that they're saying, we're going to dish it out and, and give as good as we got? And then that puts Biden in an awkward position because his instinct after serving many, many years in the Senate is to compromise. And I think he'll be under tremendous pressure from his party not to compromise if he wins this election. Mitchell, do you agree? And, and what would be the policy if, if it were a blue wave and uh, the Democrats control everything? Yeah, well, uh, uh, even without a, a, a a total blue wave. I think the Democrats might uh, gain control of the Senate, and 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 you know, Kathy's point in terms of uh, the responsibility then on 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 the Democrats in charge of 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 the ho of the House, the Senate, and the White House. Uh, how far do they go? How fast do they go in implementing uh, an agenda? And and what are the contours of that agenda in terms of the the, the progressives in the party that have not been particularly pleased uh, with Joe Biden. You know, Jim, I was reflecting today, uh, uh, I, I was up in Iowa uh, in the first days of February. Again, that's not too long ago, seven, eight, six, seven, eight months, eight months ago, uh, with a team uh, studying the Iowa caucuses. We were there on caucus night. Joe Biden came in fourth, I believe it was, maybe fifth. Uh, uh, came in at, at such a pace that no one had ever been that low in the Iowa caucuses and gone on to get the nomination. And it was the progressives of the Democratic Party uh, that were really shining. And so he's going to have to deal with that. How quickly, how far does he go? Uh, oftentimes you hear, well, you'd better go big in your first two years before those midterm elections come around. Uh, so that's going to be quite a test if there is a President Biden. Hypothetical question, Mitchell, and that is, if this blue wave happens, what does it mean for Missouri, which is a very conservative state? You, you, you know, Jim, it hasn't been. You, you, you will have the dates and know this much better than I've been in the state since 2000, now 20 years, but it hasn't been that terribly long ago where, where we, we were pointing to Missouri as always, you know, being correct in terms of the presidential election, and then we, did, we made that shift. Um, you know, there's a lot of eyes on Texas tonight uh, in, in, in terms of, well, how close might it be and, 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 and will there be a flip? Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I think we're not quite there yet in Missouri. I'm not sure if we will see us return in terms of presidential elections uh, in, anytime soon in the next, say, cycle or, or, or two cycles. That also, I think, has something to do with the nominees of the party. Now, Joe Biden might get a little closer than Hillary Clinton. I believe the last time was Bill Clinton in 92. Now, I may be off on that in terms of, of taking the state of Missouri, which was seen as a more conservative uh, uh, nominee of the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party, I think, would have to make some changes itself in terms of who it nominates uh, for, as its presidential candidates. Kathy, Missouri and Texas over the years have, have been very good at picking the winner. Uh, what do you see in Texas tonight? Well, I used to work for the Houston Post, and so I can tell you there have been election after election after election where um, the Democrats kept saying, this time we're going to do it, we're really going to win the governorship, or we're really going to win this Senate seat. So we will see, um, it, but it's certainly an example of the demographic shift um, where you see um, really new voters, a lot of new voters coming in, younger voters, voters of color, and it definitely is making Texas a more competitive state. Uh, will it actually flip? I don't know. But, you know, one thing we haven't talked about tonight, and in terms of the state's conservatism, is the the referendum, the ballot initiative. Yes. And, and we've got a wrap right yes. now, but we will get back to that. Now I'm going to send it back to KOMU8's Emily Spain in the studio.
Yeah, hey Jen, we are actually out of the newsroom now. We wanted to give you a behind the scenes tour of what things look like. And so let's take you now into the KOMU newsroom um, to show you some of our crew that's here working tonight. So this is the newsroom. We're gonna walk you down over here. This, These folks here in the middle, these are our producers. They're working on our newscasts for tonight. Those cut-ins that you might be seeing if you're watching NBC News. They're putting those together, organizing when you'll see those reporters, when you'll see different information about the races. So they're organizing the show and compiling all the information. So let's walk down a little bit further. Of course, it wouldn't be an election night if you didn't have some candy, right? We, <laughs> we have to fuel our team as well. Why not? With a little bit of sugar, right? Um, and if we move over here, we have another group. We have some of our directors who make sure that things run smoothly on the air. They decide when the uh, video starts, when the sound comes through. And, uh, there's a lot of uh, teamwork goes into what you see. Also, if we move this way, we'll show you our digital team um, in the conference room. They're working on uh, everything you see on our website and on our social pages as well. Um, so there's our folks back there in the conference room working on the web. Hey guys! <laughs> so we wanted to update you on some of the numbers that we have so far as those um, numbers start to come in and as the races or the precincts um, start to come in and as the polls have closed around seven o'clock. So I'm going to take you into our control room to get a look at um, some of the races, some of the numbers that we have so far. So as you can see it's a tight room in here. We do have some um, protection up uh, for folks that are in here at the same time. But first, let's take a look at the race for governor with 14% of precincts reporting. Nicole Galloway has 63% of the vote and Governor Mike Parson has 36% of the vote. Now, we do not know where these precincts are that are reporting so far, but we do know that we have 14% in so far. Moving on to the next issue, Amendment 3. 1% reporting, so still not many precincts reporting on this one, but the yeses have it with just that 1% at 57% uh, voting yes. Moving on to the next race for Missouri State Senate District 19 with 0% reporting, still waiting on this from Caleb Browden against Judy Baker. And in the race for the Boone County District 1 Commissioner, again 0% reporting. This is against incumbent Fred Perry and Justin Allred. Looking like it'll be 0% for the next one as well, but let's take a look. Maybe not. Yeah, still 1%. Tristan Asbury and Janet Thompson, Janet being the incumbent in that race. Let's check in on the Missouri's 4th Congressional District race with 5% reporting. Vicki Hartzler with a strong lead here, 82%. She's the incumbent, been serving in that position since 2010. So um, Lindsay Simmons with 16% of the vote. And then the Third Congressional District, Blaine Luptemeyer against Megan Rezebeck. Blaine with 60% of the vote, 39% going to Megan with 1% of precincts reporting. So it is still very early in the night here. We're still waiting for a lot of those election results to come in. And we will have them for you on KOMUA, both online and on the air. So a lot of things going on here in the newsroom to make sure that we can bring you coverage you can count on. For now, Jim, we'll send it back to you. Okay, Emily, thank you very much. And Kathy, we, we were touching on it just before we went to Emily, and, and you want to talk about Amendment 3, Clean Missouri. Uh, what do you think about the redo vote? Well, uh, we'll see what happens. Those, uh, the wording on the ballot was a little confusing, I think, to voters, uh, and it was less confusing than it might have been before a judge intervened. But it's one of those things where you have to vote no to vote yes. Um, but I think what I think is interesting about this is that um, that is that was that is on the ballot only because Missouri politicians want to change it, and the reason they want to change the outcome of the vote uh, that was taken what two a year ago, two years, yeah. two years ago is that, um, and I think it gets to the conservative how conservative Missouri is. If you look recently, there have been uh, ballot initiative after ballot initiative to overturn either what the legislature did or more more likely to. Um, to step up to deal with legislative inaction on expanding Medicaid, on right to work, and now on this. And I think what that is saying is that the legislature is more conservative than the state. And the reason for that 
is gerrymandering, which is exactly what this initiative is designed to end. Did you see the spending discrepancy between the two sides? I did not. It was huge. Um, the, the no's were, I mean, and there was a lot of money coming from out of state. And, and the problem was uh, no one could really figure out where that money was coming from. So we'll keep an eye on Amendment 3 tonight for sure. And uh, I think maybe we have some governor's numbers here, if we can put those up behind me. There we go. Okay. 16% of the precincts reporting, and Nicole Galloway has a huge lead over the incumbent. Uh, if you jump down there to the lieutenant governor's race, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised about that because Mike Kehoe, very popular lieutenant governor and very popular uh, state senator, uh, they're with the Secretary of State. Well, that's only with 1% of the precincts reporting. And there on the Secretary of State, uh, Jay Ashcroft with a pretty good lead over the person in second place, State Treasurer. Once again, a pretty good sized lead by the Republican Scott Fitzpatrick. And can we see the Attorney General's race? Once again, it's Eric Schmidt with about a 10,000 uh, vote lead. Uh, the third congressional district, Blaine Luchtemeyer, with about an 8,000 lead. Vicki Hartzler, once, once we only got 2% reporting there, so that's not very much. And District 5, Emmanuel Cleaver with a lead. Uh, District 6, ooh, that would be a shocker. Sam Graves, the incumbent, is behind in the early going. Uh, District 8, Jason Smith with a sizable lead. And then we've got the state senator race. Well, we don't have any numbers there. So, Mitchell, I want to get back with you, and I want to talk to you about the, the two candidates for president. He's not there. Well, then, Kate, Kathy, okay. I want to talk to you about it. All right. Uh, both candidates were, were very concerned about getting the Hispanic vote. Yes, because it is now uh, the, the largest, I believe, demographic uh, in the country, and it's a very fast-growing demographic. And um, both candidates are uh, campaigning hard for it. Now, interestingly, um, it looks like tonight Donald Trump made en an enormous jump in his support in the Miami-Dade area. Mm -hmm. That is a Hispanic vote that is traditionally conservative and more Republican because it's mostly Cuban-American. So Trump really pushed voters out there. And that may be one of the reasons that uh, Florida is so tight. Um, Biden is looking for Hispanic votes in other parts of the country that have uh, more traditionally uh, leaned Democrat. But one of the interesting things about Hispanic voters is um, a lot of them tend to be conservative on social issues, family values. So I think that's where uh, the president's really been pushing. Of course, his rhetoric on Mexico and on immigrants does not help. Uh, since so many uh, Hispanics in this country are first generation or second generation, so you're really talking about their families. Um, but again, uh, the president's turnout in, in Miami-Dade is impressive. I want to jump back to the Electoral College, and it seems to me maybe eight years ago, 12 years ago, Colorado did something a little bit unique where they broke up. It wasn't winner take all. Uh, the winner would definitely have the more electoral votes, but your thoughts on, on states doing something along those lines? Well, I think what you're talking about, there's a, a, a group, an organization uh, that's formed, it really formed after the 2000 race, and it's gradually been picking up steam, but they're trying to get um, the states to sign on to a compact that essentially says, as a sta the state legislature to say, we will give our electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote. And um, so in other words, uh, Hillary Clinton would have gotten a lot more electoral votes because she won the national popular vote. And um, the effort is being made because the only other way to change the electoral college is through constitutional amendment, which is very difficult. Uh, so this is an effort that's underway. They're trying to go state by state and get enough state legislatures to sign on that they could actually effectively end around the Electoral College. Okay, you talked about that constitutional amendment. What would that involve? Well, uh, you would have to get, I believe it's three quarters. Mm -hmm. I wish our political yeah. science professor were here, but I think it's three quarters uh, majority in both the House and Senate uh, supporting an amendment. 
uh, it may be two thirds, but I think it's three quarters. And then you have to get um, the state legislatures to also sign on. So it is a Lengthy years process. long process and very difficult. Your most memorable presidential election? Um, Barack Obama. I mean, it was a history making election. It really was. And, uh, you know, the best thing about being a reporter is being an eyewitness to history. The, the other thing that was great about that campaign is it drew out the very best candidates in both parties. It was an open seat and you had top-notch Republicans running, top-notch Democrats running. It was a great primary, great general election. And, you know, John McCain and Barack Obama, you can't come up with two better biographies. Uh, it was, and, and great characters to cover, sure. so it was a phenomenal race. Kathy, I appreciate your time tonight. We are out of time, and I want to thank our viewers, our streaming viewers, for joining us tonight. And be sure to stay with KOMU and KOMU.com and the mobile app, Roku and Apple TV, and you can keep watching these results tonight. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thanks for watching KOM 8 News for your Smart Decision 2020 coverage. I'm Emily Spain. We have dozens of reporters following races across the state tonight. Let's begin with KOM 8's Marissa Rios, who is live at the Boone County Clerk's Office. Marissa? Emily, we just found out within the last half hour that 80% of active voters have voted here in Boone County. Now, the energy here at the Boone County Government Center is really starting to pick up. Let's give you a look around as election judges are starting to make their way in separate polling locations, 76 different polling locations, bringing those precincts in where they will then be placed on different carts all around here. So separate different carts all around from those 76 polling locations. And those votes, they're simple. They're coming in on a simple USB stick. They're going to be uploaded um, upstairs on a computer from their flash drive and just sent in counting those votes. Now, workers have been here since the early mor morning, since polls open, counting all those absentee and the mail-in ballots, and that wrapped up around 3 p.m. this afternoon. Now, by the time the night is over, Lennon says she expects about 92,000 total votes from Boone County, and she expects a quicker turnaround for votes to get here as the lines have shortened up by the end of the day. Now, on the clerk's website, they're going to be showing unofficial totals through throughout the night. Reporting live in Columbia, Marissa Rios, KOMU 8 News. Well, Amendment 3 will determine if 2018's Amendment 1, also known as Clean Missouri, will be reformed. Let's take a look at those numbers so far tonight. With just 1% of precincts reporting the yeses have it for now with 57% of the vote and noes have 43% of the vote opposing amending the Constitution. KLB Waits' Alyssa Jackson is here with more on what Amendment 3 would do if it passes, Alyssa. Yeah, Emily, constitutional amendments like this can be kind of confusing. Amendment 3 would essentially undo another amendment that passed back in 2018. Now, voters might remember Clean Missouri approved redistricting by a demographer who is not tied to a political party. If Amendment 3 passes tonight, Clean Missouri would not take effect. Supporters of Amendment 3 really say they want to give Missourians a shot for a second chance to rep have someone represent their interests. Opponents say this amendment passing would take away the voices of minority and low-income Missourians. In the studio, Alyssa Jackson, KOMU 8 News. Here's a look now at the numbers for Missouri in the race for the White House. These candidates need no introduction. Of course, Biden with 59% of the vote, Donald Trump with 39% of the vote, with 18% of precincts reporting. We'll continue to keep you updated on Missouri's races right here on KOMU 8 News throughout the night. You can find the latest numbers scrolling there on the bottom of your screen, as well as on our website, KOMU.com.